Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Our observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your evangelist of the imagination, your existential Mr. Rogers, whatever else you want to call me. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is Rob's Observations, episode number 804. It is August 6th, 2022. Now... You know, I've had some people contacting me uh, of late uh, that have not been uh, they're not been fans of maybe the negative bent this channel's taken a little bit, uh, which I th find sort of strange. Uh, obviously, having been afforded an opportunity to experience Picard season three and my resounding uh, love of it, uh, I would have thought that that would have been something that would have been positive, but. I figured I really, I really, it was time for me. There's a lot of stuff that's on now that I'm loving. A lot of genre entertainment. I love For All Mankind. I loved um, Blackbird, the Dennis Lehane series on Apple, another Apple Plus show. Uh, I've really been enjoying a lot of, I loved Miss Marvel. I really liked Umbrella Academy. I love, of course, The Boys Season 3. I'm really looking forward uh, to a lot of things that are coming up, but nothing more so than... Netflix's adaptation of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Now, I have to tell you, The Sandman is far and away my favorite comic book series of all time. Sure, I mean, I've loved other comic book series like Howard Chaykin's American Flag. I love the George Perez uh, and Marv Wolfman run on New Teen Titans. I love Bill St. Kevin and Doug Mensch on Moon Knight. And there's, I, I really loved, you know, for X-Men, X Claremont's run and then after Claremont's run, I read X-Men for 300 issues, and there's been so many comic series throughout my life. I've got omnibuses, you know, the funny Justice League in the mid-'80s. Uh, there's so many comic book series I love, but far and away, my favorite comic book series of all time is The Sandman. And the reason why I love those 75 issues, and then there was a special, there was the Dream Hunters graphic novel, there was Sandman Overture, but it was a 75-issue run. When Neil Gaiman first started it, it was part of DC's, well, it was going to be a part of DC's Vertigo line, and it was essentially a horror comic. And the first uh, seven issues of Sandman were, in a way, while the, the groundwork was being laid, a young Neil Gaiman, a uh, newly minted comic writer, he'd written things like Black Orchid, was trying to figure it all out. And it didn't really solidify as The Sandman until issue eight which was an issue called The Sound of Her Wings that introduced Sandman's sister, Death. Uh, before that, there were all kinds of appearances from DC characters because Neil Gaiman had to fit those in because of things like Crisis on Infinite Earths in the wake of that and what was going on in Swamp Thing. And he had to deal with a lot of those things, like John Constantine, who we all know. Uh, Joanna Constantine is a character in Sandman. They introduced her in the new series. But what I wanted to do is sort of give you an overview of, of Sandman and talk about why I think that the Netflix anime, Netflix animated, the Netflix Sandman adaptation is a triumph. And it is, it is on par with Peter Jackson's adaptation of Lord of the Rings as, as being an incredibly successful adaptation. 
that does take liberties, necessary liberties, with the source material. That's what adaptation is about. But the first thing that I wanted to cover was an article that was in Variety that I want to share with you guys here. This Variety uh, article, uh, Adam Vary and Jennifer Mass wrote this. This was obviously from August 5th, uh, 2022. And Neil Gaiman talks about why this Netflix animated series is not part of the DC universe. Now, the original Sandman was, and then it, it, its tenuous connection to the DC universe sort of, it fell by the wayside, but it was still always connected. But I thought this was worth sharing. When viewers watched the ending credits for the Netflix series The Sandman, the long-anticipated adaptation of Neil Gaiman's acclaimed graphic novel series chronicling the phantasmagoric exploits of Morpheus, a.k.a. Dream, a.k.a. The Sandman, played by Tom Sturridge, they'll behold the curious site of the logo for DC Entertainment. Indeed, The Sandman was published by Vertigo, an imprint of DC Comics, from 89 to 96. Oh, well, I thought it was uh, 87. Well, there you go, 89 to 96. And in the first two volumes, which, which make up season one of the Netflix series, there are several direct... So Sandman's not 35 years old. It would be 30, uh, 33 years old. But I thought it was 87. All right, from 89 to 96. And the first two volumes, which make up season one of the Netflix series, there are several direct references to characters from the wider world of DC Comics. Much of those connections and references, however, have either been significantly altered or stripped away entirely from the live-action adaptation of The Sandman. For example, in the graphic novel, the villain John D., who is played by David Thewlis, is great, by the way, in the series, is living within Arkham Asylum, Gotham City's infamous prison for the criminally insane, and his desiccated skeletal appearance bears a strong resemblance to the DC villain Dr. Destiny, a major foe of the Justice League. On the show, however, John is living in a nondescript mental institution and has the appearance of a normal man. Meanwhile, the DC warlock and occult detective John Constantine, who has an extended interaction with Morpheus in the comics, has been gender-flipped to Joanna Constantine and has a similar, though tweaked, backstory from the legacy character. According to Gaiman, who executive produced the show with David Goyer and Alan Heinberg, these decisions had nothing to do with the volatile state of the wider DC universe of adaptations, nor the fact that The Sandman is streaming on Netflix rather than HBO Max. Indeed, for Gaiman, it was more of just a matter of bringing the TV series in line with the full arc of the graphic novels. The Sandman itself started out in the DC universe, the comic, and then it just sort of wound up wandering off into its own place, the author tells Variety. Its world joined up more and more with our world and became less and less a world in which costumed crime fighters fly around and so on, which meant that by the time The Sandman finished, it had its own aesthetic, which really wasn't the DC universe anymore. Gaiman was also eager to avoid stoking any unintended expectations. The Sandman would, in fact, link up in some meaningful way with other DC properties, especially since the graphic novel's DC references date back to a much earlier and largely defunct comic book era. We didn't want a TV show where you felt you had to have read a whole bunch of comics published in 1988 and 89 to understand what was going on, he said. Having Dr. Destiny appear on the show could lead fans to wonder loudly on the internet, are the Justice League going to show up too? Well, A, no, and B, that hasn't been the lineup of the Justice League for about 29 years at this point. That's a bunch disbanded in 1996, so no, we're not bringing in the Justice League of 1998 or 88. I think this is an amazing change. I love this change. I think it's fantastic, and I think that when you start watching The Sandman, it is its own thing from the very beginning, even though, of, of course, they do name-check Cain and Abel and the House of Secrets and House of Mystery, and Cain and Abel are, of course, characters in the show. We meet them in the second episode. Goldie. Uh, there are buried references throughout the series, but they can also be looked at as sort of general references. I mean, one of my favorite things, Sandman has been collected in so many versions. My favorite versions are the Absolute Editions. Uh, I think these are some of the greatest. These DC Absolute Editions are some of the greatest comic book um, comic book reprints of all time. And, you know, some, of the, some, some people are haters. They don't like the recoloring uh, on certain books. Like people bitch and moan and complain about the Absolute Editions of, of uh, Swamp Thing. I'm like, what, you'd prefer newsprint? <laughs> I mean, when you're dealing with heavier gauge paper, you got to change it around. I mean... Uh, I love the way that the Sandman, the comic, looks. 
um, it, it looks fantastic. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, of these books, and uh, they're amazing. So I think this change, what they've done in the series, is they've made the series feel it's of itself, and they've taken out the the first seven issues were all over the place. However, all the good stuff, all the juicy stuff that was in the first part of the Sandman arcs, they've made it very cohesive and they've made it all about the Sandman universe. Now, there are other things that um, that there's been a lot of controversy over uh, about the series, like gender flipping or race swapping. I don't care about any of that stuff because it, it works within the context of the series. I think the most controversial is the character of Death. Well, what's really interesting is the Endless... The main characters, the family, the seven endless, can take on all personifications of all different kinds of people. And indeed, in um, in episode four, when Morpheus goes to hell to confront Lucifer Morningstar, played beautifully by Gwendolyn Christie, you see a glimpse of what he looked like in Africa 10,000 years ago. G- Dream took on the guise of a black man, and uh, we see that. We actually see that. So in the sixth episode... The Sound of Her Wings, which is actually an adaptation of the eighth comic when we're introduced to the character of Death, who quickly became a fan favorite. It is played by a black actress and played beautifully. And I I think it works great. I have no problem with any of that. I have no problem with any of the the gender-flipping, sexually fluid characters at all. It doesn't... uh, Lucian, uh, another character played by a black actress, beautifully played. Uh, She is so good in the role don't care. I mean, these characters are anthropomorphized. Uh, There's no such thing as any definitive. I mean, you can go back to the comic books and if you want to be a, I guess, a comic book legalist or something. Uh, But in the comics themselves, they set up that everything is is, uh, very fluid. Uh, So I I think the adaptation of, of the series has been masterful and how they're basically taking each comic which, you know, is basically about a half an hour story and compressing it down and giving, well, not really compressing it down. They're doing, they're doing a great job. They're doing a, just, a, I think, a fantastic job. The realization that production values of this show are first rate. The depiction of hell is amazing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It sort of even evokes a favorite artist of mine, Bikinski. Um, uh, Gallery Morpheus published a lot of Bikinski's work. If you like H.R. Giger stuff, Gall- Gall- Gallery Morpheus. Uh, printed books of, of Giger's work, but they also, uh, the Polish uh, artist Bikinski. There's a lot of that in, in the production design of Sandman, and I, I'm so there for it. I'm so loving what they've done, and the acting is incredible. And, you know, I found, I, I found a review. Actually, the thing that, here's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of, there's, I've read a lot of think pieces over the last six months that talk about how Sandman, People, I loved it when I was a teenager, but now, you know, it seems a little, uh, I don't know, a little like something you'd love when you were a teenager. It was, it was kind of, you know, rock and roll, goth, whatever. It was, it was very much the same way the movie The Crow is sort of a goth anthem, the same way the beginning of The Hunger when Bauhaus plays Bella Lugosi's Dead in the club is, as Catherine Deneuve and Bowie pick up Anne Magnuson and her boyfriend and take him home. Uh, I, I mean, those are those are goth touchstones. I definitely think that Sandman and the character of Death, they're part of the reason that Hot Topic even exists at all. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just me. Could could I could be wrong about that, but um, I love the Sandman because it's about storytelling itself. It's about the power of myth. Neil Gaiman, as the series moved on, dipped in to all the different worlds mythologies and had a very interesting way of presenting. Uh, those mythologies, and it was really, really, really done, uh, done very, very well. Um, uh, Fort Gagliano, I hope I didn't miss that. Uh, you became a new member of the channel. Thank you so much for that. And you ask a question. Uh, greetings, Rob, from South Africa at 8 a.m. on a Sunday. First of all, thanks for supporting the channel. I don't think I've ever received a super chat from South Africa, so thank you. Uh, on a Sunday, as someone who read the Sandman graphic novels in the early 90s, I myself enjoy the Netflix series. I think anybody who read the uh, 
the 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 comic series when when they were younger or, or when it was first out in the late eighties and early or early nineties is going to really like this series. And of course, Tom Junior Jackson's here. Uh, Tom Junior Jackson, goof emeritus. He he coined the phrase "We are all goof people." That is one of the uh, uh, sayings on this channel. So Tom is here. Uh, Tom says. Good to see you, Rob. I wonder if this show has a lot to do with the audio drama as well. Now, for those of you who don't know, there's an 11-hour, I think, version of the audio drama that um, I loved. I think the audio drama is a little bit overwritten, but it's really, really, really great. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's incredible. So, um, yeah, it's it's I I uh, I'm I'm just a big fan of what they've done, and. Um, it's nice to have watched something that I had such high expectations for, and I really, uh, I really loved it. I thought it was a terrific adaptation. Now, I found a, a review that I want to read, that I want to share with everyone. Uh, it is a review that I think nails it, and believe it or not, comes from NPR of all places. And uh, this review comes from Glenn Weldon, and he published this on August 5th, and he says, for fans and non-fans alike, Netflix, The Sandman, is a dream come true. First, to the many nervous fans of The Sandman among you, relax, they nailed it. Yeah, it took forever and a slew of aborted attempts, but the Netflix adaptation of the landmark comic book series just works. It succeeds as a faithful presentation of the look, feel, and story of The Lord of Dreams as presented in the comics, which was written by Neil Gaiman with art by Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg and many other pencilers and inkers over the years. Far more importantly, however, it succeeds as a work of adaptation. Totally agree. Where the recent audiobook versions strictly adhered to every infinitesimal detail of the 1989-95 comic run, and as a result ended up feeling both dated and overwritten, the Netflix series' grip on the source text is gratifyingly looser. It breathes. Changes, big and small, have been made to the characters and storylines that streamline, update, and focus the narrative, now honed to fit the specific propulsive demands of serialized television. I totally agree with this. I totally agree with this. And of course, the first seven issues were really a difficult adaptation because so much of it was steeped in DC Comics lore, and they really, I mean, other than the 24-hour story with Dr. Destiny, now John, going into the diner with the ruby, I couldn't believe they even did that, and then, of course, going to battling Lucifer or battling Corazon, uh, what happened in the original comic, those were great, and they've retained those stories. They've retained the whole idea of going after his missing, his, his bag of sand, his helm, and his uh, rubies, those were retained because those were unique to the show, but all the other stuff has been jettisoned, and I think it's great. It really works uh, because whenever I've given people the comics, they've been confused a little bit, especially if they're not steeped in DC lore by the um, uh, uh, by the DC nature of it all. The, the adaptation, the Netflix adaptation gets rid of all of that. So it's great. Now, to everyone else coming to these stories and characters fresh, I have absolutely no idea how you're going to take this. The show, like the comic, throws a lot at you right out of the gate, but I think there's a better than average chance you might finally begin to understand why the rest of us have been pestering you to read the comics all of these years. The Sandman is the story of Morpheus, a.k.a. Dream. He's one of the endless. A handful of abstract concepts, dream, death, desire, despair, etc., that assume the anthropomorphic shapes of bickering siblings. While immensely powerful and immortal, they are bound by rules and duties as they oversee aspects of human existence. Morpheus, for his part, controls the dreaming, a vast realm of adventures, delights, and horrors that humans visit when we sleep. The comic begins in 1916 when a self-styled British occultist traps Morpheus within a magic circle and robs him of his tools of office. The Magus was aiming to capture Morpheus' sibling death, but must have transposed a rune or two, that poor sap, how Dream escapes after many years of captivity and how he sets about repairing the damage done in his absence to both his realm and the waking world is the first story arc of what became a 75-issue series. The second arc deals with his attempts to round up dreams and nightmares that have escaped the dreaming. The 10 episodes of the Netflix series cover both of these first storylines. 
uh, from horrific to mythic. Now, look, the comic is beloved and has accrued richly deserved awards and acclaim, but it helps to keep in mind that everything the comic became over the course of its 75 issues, a sweeping, sprawling epic of myths and monsters that takes its subject nothing less than the power of stories to change the world, was not what it was at the beginning. And that's what I was saying with all the DC stuff. The Sandman was envisioned and promoted as a horror comic. Marketing materials featured an image of Morpheus cradling a pile of sand in his palm alongside a line from the T.S. Eliot poem, The Wasteland, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. And there is, when I saw this photograph of um, this, uh, of Dream with his sister Death, who's played by Kirby Howell Baptiste, I mean, she's fantastic in the role. She's dressed like Death was. She's being played by a black actress instead of a pale looking white goth chick i don't mind this at all i think this worked really really well and she's fantastic in the role and the episode the sound of her wings which also introduced the character of hob gadling a favorite of mine is in the show as well the sandman was also created by a young writer still finding his voice still stepping out of the shadow of writers like alan moore and stephen king Take its sixth issue, set at a diner where a character uses one of Morpheus's tools to cruelly torment the staff and customers. Uh, it was widely praised at the time, as was a later storyline involving child abuse, sexual violence, and serial murder. Reading these issues over now, they remain harrowing, albeit in a kind of facile, unearned way. Their lurid shocks read like a writer trying to see what he could get away with, favoring glib cleverness over emotional truth. There's an essential emptiness that flattens the characters into so many writing exercises meant to elicit our reflective disgust instead of our empathic connection. Now, I got to say, I totally agree with that. And it's not because I've gotten older, but, you know, if you go back and you reread the comic, it was supposed to be a horror comic and the Vertigo comics um, were trying to get away with a lot of shit. And whether you're reading whether it was Swamp Thing or whether you're reading, of course, Garth Innes' The Preacher, which is probably the greatest example of all that, they were really leaning into all of this. But The Sandman, I thought, as it moved along, became a little bit more highbrow. Now, a lot of people aren't going to buy. I'm sure there's a lot of people. You, you really need, like, here's the thing. One of my favorite movies of all time is Amelie, which came out in 2001. I would say that that... The Sandman is for the same sensibility that loves Amelie. And there's a lot of people, I don't know, I guess the word twee comes to mind. If you don't like the idea that magic can exist all around us, uh, I can understand that there's just going to people, there's going to be people that just are, are going to encounter Sandman for the first time and be like, what the hell is this? Why am I watching this? I get it. It's for a very specific kind of sensibility. And um, a lot of people are surprised how much I love the Sandman or how much I love Amelie, uh, but but there is there is a lot of that uh, in the show, and so in order to jump because because reality and fantasy are colliding all the time in the Sandman show, and you if you're not into that, you might have to really sort of readjust your sensibilities to make it work for you. Um, let me just go uh, and finish this review. These horror story elements remain in the Netflix series, but producers Neil Gaiman, David Escoria, and Alan Heinberg have made choices in adapting them for the screen that dig more deeply and resonate more truly. Where the comic, like so many narratives before and since, used violence against children, women, and marginalized communities to spur its white knight protagonist into action, the Netflix series is eager to allot such characters more agency, more independence, more roundedness, more life. In fact, every choice made in the process of adaptation bends the narrative toward a more sincere, more humane, and more emotionally expansive telling. Writing that this was originally bound up in self-satisfied cleverness here feels deeply engaged and thoughtful. I couldn't agree with that more, to be honest. And, you know, a lot of people, again, are leaning heavily into the fact they're calling this a woke show. Now, remember, Dream... As as he, he probably first his first human persona was as a black man in Africa, his first lover, a woman that he was in love with, is actually uh, in the show. She was the queen of the first peoples, like maybe the first tribe of Homo sapiens, not uh, uh, um, the first Homo sapiens, not say Neanderthals that existed on Earth. 
And of course, she spurned his love, and he banished her to hell for ten thousand years, which which becomes and, and you see that, and you see that Morpheus's first guys and probably his first human guys was that of a black man. So the idea when people talk about oh, the show was woke, it was always that way. <laughs> so it's not like this is anything new. It's just in the comic, you know, com the the medium of the comic, you have to have your easily identified characters. But I mean, hell, Morpheus appears as a black cat. In Dream of a Thousand Cats, which which is an ep issue of the Sandman that I'm wondering if they're going to do. I think I tweeted once to Neil Gaiman. I'm like, bruh, are you going to do Dream of a Thousand Cats? Like, how would you do that? That was the one comic book in my life I gave to my mom to read. I had to kind of give her the setup, but she loved the idea that, that house cats could dream away all of humanity so cats can rule the world. <laughs> um. So it means that the TV series is setting itself up effectively for the long term. Should the Sandman get all the subsequent seasons it deserves, its central narrative will become an intimate and deeply emotional one about a man whose sense of duty and inflexible preconceived sense of self keeps him from engaging with others and from experiencing the kind of emotional growth necessary to adapt to a changing world. In the comic, the writing eventually grew past its familiar, reductive horror trappings to embrace and meaningful en meaningfully engage such deeper truths. The Netflix series is already doing that work. What's more, all of that good, chewy, satisfying work is aided immeasurably by the casting of Tom Sturridge as Morpheus. Sure, he looks the part with his alabaster skin, sculpted cheekbones, lean frame, and Robert Smith hair. And yeah, he delivers most of his lines in a throaty whisper that recalls both an ASMR YouTuber and Eddie Redmayne in Jupiter Ascending. The non-shouty bits. But how else would you imagine giving voice to Morpheus of the comics whose striking word balloons, ingeniously designed by the great Todd Klein, were rendered as solid black with white lettering? What's important is that Sturridge captures the competing aspects of Morpheus that are forever roiling under his impassive surface. His haughtiness, his wounded vulnerability, his stiffness, his longing for connection, also his brittle anger, his ability to almost and not quite but almost laugh at himself. The series smartly beefs up the role of Dream's librarian. Uh, that would be uh, Lucien, played by, uh, now f forgive my French, is not good, Vivienne uh, Archimpong. We learn that unlike in the comic, her loyalty is not born solely out of blind duty. It's informed by her own deeply personal sense of purpose. I love the portrayal of Lucienne in this. It, she's fucking great. She looks great. I love the way she acts the part. It's really, really good. Uh, Boyd Holbrook's take on the rogue, eyeball-chomping nightmare, The Corinthian, whose role is also greatly expanded from the comic to good effect, oozes a malicious southern charm as two of Dream's immortal siblings, Kirby Howell Baptiste and Mason Alexander Park, as Desire, evoke the iconic elements of their characters while making the roles distinctly their own, and David Thewlis, playing a would-be supervillain, shifts fluidly between pitiable wretch and malicious manipulator, and he's outfitted with a motivation that clarifies his character's goals, which are a bit muddier in the comic. I, you know, I can't agree more with this review. You know, I really, I, I thought it was incredible. And, and here's the thing. You know, a friend of mine, Zach Stentz, who co-wrote Thor and X-Men First Class, and he was working on the Crustaceous Jurassic Park animated series, he was tweeting out just tonight, he said, you know, I wonder if when I watch this series you know will it will it do justice to my late 80s self and a lot of people are reassessing the series and i think you know this review does a really good job of of um addressing those issues because you know the comic book medium it really can only go so far and at the time what neil gaiman was doing with sandman was really new as far as comic books were concerned and it also, he had to deal with DC editors and he had to deal with what was going on in the DC universe and navigate those waters. Then at the same time, uh, all bets were off with Vertigo Comics. I mean, it was DC, but they were getting away with murder. Stuff that only indie comics were, were, were even attempting. I mean, you go back and you read Preacher. For those of you who've read the or watched the, the, the series, I mean, the comic was far more extreme. And I mean, I remember reading Preacher going, oh my God, you know. What Clive Barker would do in his books like A Magica, <laughs> you'd read it. I mean, it was these were it was a heady time. It was a it was a heady time. It was a frothy mix of getting the Cures album Disintegration, which by the way, 
I know. I mean, getting kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, and then disintegration from the cure. These were heady times, my friends. And, and really, I think that there was something about the Sandman that was deeply rooted, not just in goth music, but in punk music as well. I mean, it really was, it was, you couldn't, you couldn't be reading Sandman and not be buying the latest Cure record. It was all, it all fed into that same pop culture zeitgeist thing that was going on. And by the way, if you are a fan of what you're seeing and you, you've never listened to Cure before or whatever, Disintegration is a great record. <laughs> so is Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. A little harder edge, but Disintegration, it's good stuff, man. And watch the 1993, uh, there's a live track, one of my, one of my favorite Cure, um, uh, uh, one of my favorite Cure um, tracks is a forest, and there's a live. You can see it on YouTube. There's a live version of a forest. It's like 13 minutes long. That to me, I mean, the, the Cure just not just because Dream looks like Robert Smith, but because the sound of it all. You know, when you read when I read the Sandman comic, I heard the album Disintegration because it came out around the same time. Anyway, I don't mean to belabor that point, but uh, you know, Terror. Uh, Terror says, the actress who played Lucifer did great, but is it too much to ask for a blonde-haired male Lucifer? We've now had two interpretations and neither match the source material. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's true because remember, the TV show Lucifer is also, Lucifer and Mazikeen are both, they both come out of the Sandman. And, you know, but here's here's what I would say. It, it, it's like, the the I'll tell you I'll t I swear to God and I don't know if this is true I've never asked Neil Gaiman this before I've been on panels with him before but the, there is a Star Trek episode called Arena and and at the end this alien the Metron appears and I swear to God the way Lucifer is drawn in um, at first is drawn like the Metron in the Star Trek episode Arena but I mean I can understand here here's here's the thing. Um, Neither match the source material, but would that character look... I mean, I loved when Morpheus squares off against Lucifer, Morningstar, and Hell, and they change their outfits and all the way. Um, I, uh, I, I just... I, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me because most comic book characters... I think the MCU does a pretty good job of, of recreating those characters. In, they, they, they do a great job with the costumes, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't bother me that much. Um, I mean, I understand that the look is, is uh, I love when he's in Australia at the end of Season of Mist, but I won't get into that. Um, it's great. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, nice Planet of the Apes shirt, Rob. Uh, my friend Darren Docterman made this, Tom. For those of you, yeah, uh, people like my geeky t-shirts, and I would say that um, uh, this one, the sp the space agency that uh, Anza that launches Charlton Heston and his compatriots into space and Planet of the Apes. That's what the shirt is. I love that you recognized what a deep cut it is. You know how I love my my geeky shirts. So anyway, um, yeah, and I, I just think that this this review. Let's see. There's there's some more points that I thought were pretty salient in this review. Um, the main thing that will strike readers familiar with the comic as they watch these 10 episodes unfold is this. How much more cleanly and clearly the story emerges now that it's been freed of the DC Comics editorial mandates that Neil Gaiman and his collaborators had to navigate back in the day. Without, for example, having to find a way to squeeze in a cameo by members of the Justice League. Or shake up of Hell's ruling hierarchy taking place in another writer's comic or untangle various pre-existing DC characters' backstories that have been pummeled into dust by a string of company-wide reboots, retcons, and relaunches, the Netflix series simply unspools dreams, travails, and triumphs, confidently collapsing characters and storylines together to keep things rolling along. To fans of the comic, the changes introduced into the adaptation offer intriguing new variations on now-familiar themes without erasing what we love. In fact, they make even more satisfying these moments when characters from the comics leap to the screen. And this is the reviewer saying, every time I reread the comic, I'm thrilled when the fates appear in corporeal form. They're some of Gaiman's most fascinatingly creepy, inscrutable, and darkly funny creations, and their Netflix versions do not disappoint. The comic only got richer, bolder, and more immersive as it went, issue after issue, until it reached its profoundly satisfying conclusion. 
The Netflix series deserves the chance to do the same. Here's hoping that it gets to. Now, again, I just want to say this review was the NPR review um, that was written by Glenn Weldon, and I agree with all of these points that he's making. And, you know, I don't. I, it's going to be interesting to see a whole new generation of people that, that were not affected by The Sandman, that didn't read it. I mean, I think reading it for me in college and moving... I had moved from L.A. to California, from Seattle to Los Angeles, and I was going to USC and beginning my career in the film business. And, um, you know, it came out, and I, I worked on my first movie. I worked on Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And, and it, was, it was all, it all, the Sandman was definitely a big part of my life. So whether people are going to rediscover it now, because, again, it takes a very specific sensibility to an Amelie sensibility. And it really does. And I'm watching with Elizabeth, and she and I sort of bonded over when we first met. Elizabeth and I um, bonded over over Amelie, and that was one of the things that when we got together we, we talked about. But it was that kind of a sensibility, you know, finding wonder in the world. And and I, I love those. A lot of people are like somebody said in, in uh, the live chat that the anthropomor anthropomorphization of, like, death and all that, that it was a little, I don't know, old hat or old fashioned. I, I don't think so. I mean, because we've been watching personifications of, of devils and, and, and characters, it, it, whether it's in the twilight zone, whether it's in old movies like the devil and Daniel Webster or, you know, conjure wife when they, when they did, uh, um, uh, uh, burn, burn, which burn. I mean, I've, I've always loved the anthropomorphic morph, morphization of, of gods and legendary characters. I've always loved that. It's been a thing that I've met, which is part of why I think, I really have always loved uh, the Sandman, but as far as as far as it all goes, I, I just think that this adaptation is first rate. I think that Goyer and, and Neil Gaiman have really and, and Alan Heinberg have really nailed what they're trying to do. I think the actors are doing a great job of it. You know, I, I watched, I sat down, and watched the first six episodes because I wanted to get to the sound of her wings, and you know, it was a story that I've, I've read that comic a hundred times, and to to see it realized and then have it dovetail with the story of Hob Gadling, Hob Gadling, another uh, character that I, I always loved who, who, was, who comes back late in the Sandman series in a beautiful way. And uh, Hob Gadling will one day hopefully uh, tell you why I hate Ren Fairs. <laughs> because he was correct and so was Morpheus. Um, uh, it was, uh, it, it, it just, I, I love this show and it, well, you know, it's not perfect. I mean, nothing is. It's it's not going to I don't think it's it it works on an emotional level and an imaginative level and you really have to be open to this kind of material. It isn't Lord of the Rings. It's not Game of Thrones. You know, it's something that's very different than than that. And I just think that there are not a lot of people that are going to necessarily dig it. Um, as much as I do, but I'm very curious to see how all of how all of this is going to be received. And you know, not a lot of people are talking about. It. I think people, I have a real connection to it. And you know, if I might recommend, if you're a fan of the comics, these are great uh, books. These are coffee table books. There's four volumes, um, and these are these are this is the annotated Sandman, and. Uh, it, it does a deep dive into the comics and all the references that Neil Gaiman makes. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if these are hard to get now or easy to get. I, I don't know if they've been republished maybe because the city, the, the, uh, the series is coming out. But if you're a Sandman fan, this is actually the fourth volume. There's four volumes of these. Um, if you like the show, you know, get, get Sandman. Um, and I think, uh, I think that, um, I think you guys will all, really really love it at least i i mean i hope you do i hope you really like like it um because uh, you know i think it's a wonderful series and it, it was just nice to love something again you know what i mean uh our, our friend lynn hobday all the way from japan uh how are you lynn lynn says disintegration especially the b-side is one of my favorite albums ever i miss the days when soundtracks were gothic I've never read The Sandman. Would you suggest I read it before watching the series? Actually, Lynn, it might be sacrilegious of me to say this, but no, I don't think you should read the comic anymore because 
the my all, always my problem when I was trying to get people to read the comic is I, I had to explain the first seven issues. Now, some of the issues you they weren't necessarily connected to the DC universe, such as the the twenty four hour episode and the episode where Dream has to go to hell to get his helm back. I think that the series does a really good uh, job of distilling what the Sandman is, and it doesn't confuse anybody by its overt references to the DC universe, and 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 it doesn't have DC characters in the um, it doesn't have char- DC characters, uh, with the exception of Joanna, uh, Joanna Constantine, I guess you could say. But and then and Cain and Abel were in House of Secrets and House of Mystery, but those are those are also characters that come from other other places. So, no, read, read, read the comics after you watch a series, and I don't even think you have to do that anymore, as sacrilegious as that might be. Um, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see if, if they do that. I don't know. Our friend Stubble McShave says, I love the adaptation of The Sandman. I'm not that familiar with the source material. Do you think the Netflix binge model will help or hurt it. Oh, I think definitely the binge model um, will help this series because it it is, I mean, the the pace of this thing, it's just whipping along at uh, at a major major clip. And what I love about it is there's all of these mini stories within the episodes and they get resolved within an episode and then other, the other story carries on. And it all feels like one long story. It doesn't feel episodic to me at all. And I'm really loving where the series and how they set it up and how they introduced the characters and where it all went. And, um, I mean, my favorite Sandman storyline is still uh, the season of Mists. And I think that would probably end up being a season-long storyline. I mean, maybe they'll get there next season because that's, you know, that's where they're going, that season of Mists storyline. And I won't tell you what it is, but it has to do with a rematch, obviously, it's set up in in episode four when when Dream goes to hell and confronts Luz for Morningstar, the first of the fallen. And you know you've wow, it's um yeah, just watch it, you guys. Stubble, Lynn, I think you're both gonna love love it. I'll be curious. I think that um, Stubble, you'll really like Sandman. Um, I mean, you said you like the adaptation, so I don't know if you watch the whole thing, but uh, you you'll get it. You'll get it. I mean, the only re- the only reason if you want to watch or go back, the comic books are great, and they'll, you know, you can see where the series goes. But um, yeah, I really I really enjoyed it. Now, there's a caveat I have. I was really disappointed with the look of the first episode. I thought the first episode the blacks were too crushed. You couldn't see much. I thought it was really dark. A lot of people haven't had this um, problem. I don't, you know. I have a very calibrated, I have very calibrated displays, and um, it, they both. It, the first episode bothered me as the series went along, kind of evened out for me. But there's a really interesting thing that happened that I wanted to share with you guys. People have noticed that the aspect ratio of the series is changing, and uh, which I thought was was bizarre. You know, as I'm watching this because I'm I'm you know very much in a home theater, and I really did think. Um, that it was it was a it's a bizarre thing that the that the series was doing and apparently you know the sandman aspect ratio netflix explains it was a deliberate creative choice behind the divisive skewed imagery so yeah they they have done that you'll notice the aspect ratio of the show changes and you can do that in post but to me one of the things that i didn't like about that is it felt like the the color the color grading of the show and the changing aspect ratio seemed to me that was something they did in post they decided that was not what they decided to do when the show was originally shot and i'm i'm kind of a stickler for that and now we live in an age first of all where movies get transferred to home video in 4K which i love but a lot of time the original directors and the original cinematographers aren't around to comment on it so you'll get, or they, they're unavailable to participate. So movies get altered from what they were supposed to look like when they, when they originally finished, the original intent of the film. Most recently, one of my beloved, I love Basic Instinct and Jan Debont's photography, when Studio Canal remastered it for 4K, they leaned heavily into the whole teal and blue, or the teal and orange, the 
the teal blue and the orange color uh, palette. And that wasn't part of the original grade of the film. And they sort of leaned heavily into that. It doesn't really look, it's not really supposed to look like that. The transfer looks better than any home video version. But the coloring of the movie was, I believe, I mean, the way I remember it, much colder. And Basic Instinct, like Die Hard, these Jean de Bont movies, and, and Flatliners. I can't wait to see what Flatliners look like, because that also, Jean de Bont's cinematography was very difficult to, to, to reproduce on home video because of the limitations of NTSC and then HD. But with 4K, Die Hard looks amazing. Flatliners just came out this week. I haven't watched the 4K disc. But Jan de Bont shot that as well, and I'm curious to see what that color palette looks like because a lot of the a lot of the the films when they're getting remastered don't look great. But then sometimes you get a Die Hard, which has looked like shit on home video for a long time. When you get that 4K, it's a revelation. Same with a movie like The Matrix. So good stuff there. Um, Sister Harrow uh, became a member of the channel. She became an imagination connoisseur. Well, Sister Harrow. Uh, thank you for that. I very much appreciate you becoming a member of the channel. Now, there have been, like um, right here, Justin Kipper points out that there are movies that have changed their aspect ratio. Most recently, IMAX films. Like we've seen that the, 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 Disney, um, the Disney movies have all been enhanced for IMAX. And the first people that really did that, Christopher Nolan was shooting IMAX sequences for something like The Dark Knight. And then Warner Brothers recreated those on video. They would put the IMAX sequences would be more full frame, and then you had the 239 or 235 aspect ratio for the rest of the film. But that's how the movies were shot. They were not manipulated in post to look that way. You had IMAX sequences, and I, look, I prefer the IMAX versions of Infinity War and Endgame, um, but Disney did not release those on home video, but you can see them with those aspect ratios on, on Disney+. Plus. But the thing is, those aspect ratios, it was shot that way. Now, I don't as a post supervisor myself and a film editor, I don't mind that kind of post manipulation, but sometimes I think people go too far. I really still stand by the fact that I think that the first episode of Sandman, I was like, I was really annoyed by how the blacks were crushed and how mostly how the details lost when you crush blacks that, that far down. Like if you're looking at someone's suit, you can't see the fabric, the the texture of the fabric. When they went into Roderick's house, his mansion, you couldn't see any of the set design, and certainly when they're in his basement, I'm like, what the hell is this? But it's gotten better as the show has gone along. And a lot of the time, too, the, the color timing, it's really difficult. When, when Morpheus is standing next to somebody who's darker skinned, it's really hard to light that. And you can see a lot of that. Sometimes people's faces look very muddy. It's tough. But the aspect ratio thing that they're trying to make, ooh, it's more dreamy so we can switch the... It really, it's something that's noticeable, and I, 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 I will bet you dollars to donuts that they did not intend to do that when they shot the film. And I would love to hear the cinematographers weigh in on whether or not that's something that they wanted to do. And I, I don't know if that, that is the case. I, you know, I really, I don't know. Um, so, hard to say. Anyway, so... I'm really enthusiastic about the Sandman. I can't believe that I'm getting to see it. Um, you know, I didn't read this article, but um, uh, Sandman viewers first noticed the skewed images in the trailers for the series, sparking some trepidation amongst fans of the original comic book series. The distorted images were not isolated to the trailer, remaining a mainstay in the series itself. And some question whether a technical issue was causing the distinctive visuals. However, a spokesperson person for Netflix confirmed that the image distortion is a deliberate creative choice now will baldy sam heisman and george Steele serves the show's cinematographers and the group has yet to comment on the type of lenses they use to film the production if for example vintage lenses were used and mixed with an 8k camera the combination of old glass on a new camera could work to create image distortion alternatively using old school wide angle lenses with the distortion on the sides would create stretched visuals so there's no need to fix your TV or adjust your aspect ratio. The Sandman looks exactly how its creators wanted it to. And in a way, since it is a comic book, I mean, I guess I could buy into that sort of. I just think that that's a, I mean, it's an interesting choice. I would like to hear the sound, uh, the cinema sound, the cinematographers address the issues. Because did they, re did they really mean it to look that way? Was that the creative intent from the beginning? Who knows? No man can say. 
Well, as people who might not have ever watched Rob Observations, I don't know if I've ever done a Midnight Rob Observations, really. But as people know on this show, I read viewer letters. And if you want to send me a viewer letter to be read on Rob Observations, you can go right down here at the bottom, right down there. It says www.postgeeksingularity.com. Go there. Go to the website. Check it out. There's a place to send me a letter. And I, I've got a few letters to read, as I do. Nathan K. writes in and says, Hello, Rob. Back in February, I wrote you a letter asking about science fiction and specifically whether or not I should watch Star Trek, having never seen it before. I recently finished watching Star Trek The Original Series, and I wanted to take this opportunity to write you a follow-up letter and share some of my thoughts as a literal newcomer to the franchise, which I imagine you don't hear too often. Overall, I thoroughly enjoy the show. One of the first things that stood out to me was that the look and design of the show does not look nearly as outdated as I expected it to. The sets overall look really good, and in particular, the sets for the various locations on board the Enterprise look great, especially the bridge. And I think the episodes that took pri place primarily or entirely on board the Enterprise have aged very well. Also, as I got later into the series, I started to lose perspective, and I found myself getting sucked in and forgetting that I was watching a TV show made in the 60s. When I wrote in back in February, I asked you for recommendations of where to start watching. I honestly was expecting you to say the original series, The Next Generation, or something else. So I was surprised when you recommended four specific episodes of the original series, which were The Corbomite Maneuver, Balance of Terror, The Doomsday Machine, and The Immunity Syndrome. In an effort to go chronologically, I started by watching The Corbomite Maneuver. I have to say that not only did I think it was a great episode and a great recommendation, but from this one episode, I believe I was able to see why it is you love Captain Kirk as a character. The episode has a superior force, force threatening the Enterprise for what they perceive to be hostile intentions from the Enterprise, and the whole episode is the crew and Captain Kirk caught in a volatile standoff between them and the other force that shows Kirk as a resolute captain that possesses the composed temperament necessary to be the captain of a starship, especially in a situation where any wrong decision could result in the ship being destroyed and the entire crew being killed. This was a great episode and an excellent recommendation to start watching the show. From there, I just watched the series from the beginning and enjoyed the great stories with fascinating sci-fi ideas that were told from episode to episode. I will definitely be continuing with the franchise moving on to the movies and the other TV shows. As of right now, I'm able to say something that I never expected I would ever say, that regarding Star Trek, I am a fan. This is almost entirely because of you and how you endlessly wax rhapsodic about this franchise. Thank you, Rob, and may you live long and prosper. Yours truly, Nathan K. Well, Nathan, that's certainly how you get on my good side. So thank you for that. This next letter comes from David Conlon. It's short and sweet. Hi, I'm a huge longtime fan of the show and also the John Campia show. Here's my pitch. In Loki episode six, we see two black holes at the beginning. We zoom into one and discover that's where the sacred timeline was located, which would suggest that the black hole contained an entire multiverse, which would also suggest that the other one did too. It may just be me, but it looked like those black holes were about to collide with one another. Could this be the event which took place at the beginning of the 2015 Secret Wars graphic novel? With incursions being a thing in the MCU now, I think it's safe to say Secret Wars is 100% down the road. Also, have you ever read the Preacher graphic novels? It's so good, I think you would enjoy it. Never stop bringing us amazing content. Thank you. Well, David Conlon, yes, I have all the Preacher graphic novels. You know what I need to get is the absolute versions of Preacher. I don't have that. But I want to thank you for writing in. Obviously, that's um, a very interesting observation that you've made. And uh, I think that there's probably a lot right in what you're saying. I mean... We know that this is the multiverse saga now. Don't know where it's all going, but um, we'll see. We shall see. Um, I hope. I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see where they're going to take all this multiverse stuff. I hope it resolves well. Obviously, we know we're getting um, the, the, the whole Kang Dynasty storyline, which I really love. I've been reading it. As a matter of fact... Um, you know, I, I had it right here. This is this actually this before they started doing regular omnibuses. This hardcover, this Avengers hardcover, 
uh, when they were doing the Avengers Assemble run. This is episode or issue five. If you just want to read the Kang Dynasty and you want a nice version of it, uh, oh, I don't know what's on here. Dust, a leaf running from outside. But this is a great version of the Kang Dynasty storyline, which I would recommend. Um, and let's see what else. Brandon Pinchback just sends in a super chat. Uh, thank you for that, Brandon. I appreciate it. Glenn Mark says, I watched Poltergeist and the Abyss the first time because of the light and magic doc. Well, what did you think about them? Did you, um, did, you, did you dig them? And which version of the Abyss? I hope you watched the director's cut, the long version of the Abyss. It's like a half an hour longer because it's, I think, so much better than the theatrical version. Mm. We, we shall see. Um, who knows? Could be. Um... This next one comes from Joe from Montreal. Hey, Rob, I'm pretty much a centrist when it comes to politics. I never let the left, right, or middle anything dictate what I like in my entertainment. I'm surprised to read bad reviews for Amazon's The Terminal List. I found it an entertaining action series like Jack Reacher. What's the problem with that? A well-told story that doesn't pander to anyone. I don't buy that it's only for red states or conservative audiences. My father is one of the biggest liberals out there, and he loved it. Do we all need to eat fiber every day? Can't we just enjoy a bowl of sugary goodness once in a while? Joe from Montreal. Yeah, you know, Joe, um, here's the funny thing. I've, I've always thought that most things that are action-adventure that deal with military or all that, immediately they're branded as being right-wing, as if, you know, we're not supposed to have a military that protects our country. Um I thought the terminal list was another entry into a long line of that kind of story. I'm a big conspiracy theory story junkie. I love all that stuff. I didn't think it was particularly political. It was about the military industrial complex and spy shenanigans and international intrigue and politics. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. I, I think that people do, who didn't grow up with that stuff think it's, well, this is overtly political. Of course, it's about the, it's about it's about the military. It's about our government. It's going to have some of those things. But yeah, I think you got to be able to enjoy that stuff, right? Come on now. <laughs> I liked it. It's. I mean, how can you not like action movies and delve into it and have a good time? Uh, Michael Preston sends in a super chat and says, Hi, Rob, and the Post Geek Singularity. Do you feel that Star Trek's biggest failing is that there's no joy in new Star Trek? Like Emperor Kalos once said, Where's the joy? Yeah, I, I don't feel there's any joy in modern Star Trek. What's what's really strange to me is I don't believe it. In a, in a quasi-military uh, environment, I don't... The, the, my biggest... The thing that I hate the most about Star Trek Discovery Picard, other than Season 3 and especially um, Strange New Worlds, is no one acts like they should in a quasi-military hierarchy or structure. I don't, I don't like the way people talk to each other. I don't like what the characters... It feels to me like they're... And a lot of the time, they write generic emotional scenes that could be plucked into virtually any TV series, much less Star Trek. Um, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I don't believe that anybody is acting like they're actually in a Star Trek universe. And it drives me crazy. And yeah, there's not a whole lot of joy in it. Where's the joy in explore, exploration? The joie de vivre in being out there. And... Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, a really great point, Michael, that you're making about where is the joy. Um, so, yeah, it really, it really bums me out. By the way, I love when, I love in the live chat when you do these late night things. Love chat X Y Z, the best adult dating site. Like, really? Okay, so what are you gonna do? <laughs> it's funny, um, but thanks, thanks, Tom, for being a great, a great uh, moderator. Um, Kevin Martinez writes in and says, Hello, Rob. Through your show, I have developed an interest in the James Bond films, particularly the Brosnan era. And I'm only 21, but even knowing that the Daniel Craig Bond movies were out there, I wasn't particularly interested in them. But when I finally got around to watching all four Brosnan films last week, I found myself a fan of the character. GoldenEye is the best out of all of them, and it really brings, brings Bond into the modern era. Tomorrow Never Dies has a pretty interesting villain, even though he is a Rupert Murdoch parody, and Michelle Yeoh steals the, the show. 
World is Not Enough has the best theme and Electric King is a strong villain, but the ending fight on the submarine feels like a sloppy action scene. But what the hell, Denise Richards looks hot, <laughs> though. And finally, Die Another Day is the worst of them, and it felt at that point the writing was on the wall for James Bond. People have a problem with the Madonna theme, but I like it. Most of the film just feels weird. The plot just doesn't line up, and Gustav Graves has to be downright the worst bad guy in the series with his cheap Power Ranger armor at the end. But even with all of that, the Brosnan era never got his never got the due with the series. I was shocked to find out the plot of the movie they were supposed to make ended up being turned into a video game called Everything or Nothing, and the villain, the villain was Willem Dafoe. This feels like it would have been a great movie. What is your take on this? Thanks for reading. Well, you know what? Uh, let me tell you, Kevin, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay, or we park our rockets in the same volcano base. If you've seen the Sean Connery film, You Only Live Twice. Uh, look, I agree. I, you know, I like the Brosnan era. I thought it, it started strong. I think at three out of four stars, Goldeneye was definitely a three out of four star film. I really liked it. I didn't think there was really enough Bond in it, but I love the fact 006 was the villain. I liked the plot. I liked everything that happened. I love Judy Dench's M when she calls Bond a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a product of the Cold War. I mean, that was dope. Um, Tomorrow Never Dies was, you could tell it was edited, and they borrowed, like, the character of Stamper, the, the henchman in Tomorrow Never Dies, was supposed to have had his pleasure and pain centers reversed, kind of like Robert Carlyle in World Is Not Enough, which I also like, but you're right. The fight scene at the end's a little goofy, and of course, Christmas Jones is bizarre, and how she got hired, I don't know. Somebody probably just wanted to meet her. And I did like the Electric King storyline, but those scripts, they all kind of felt a little light. They weren't, they didn't have enough gravitas. I actually read the novelization of um, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, and it felt a lot more substantial. It's like they cut half the movie out in editorial. At least that's how it felt to me. I like Tomorrow Never Dies, but I don't love it. it it's just, it's it's a good action movie, but yeah, the Brosnan era really, it went downhill, and Die Another Day is embarrassing. Uh, I did like the opening in North Korea, but Gustav Graves, who's actually a plastic surgery altered North Korean general or whatever, it was just like, wait, what? What's going on here? Although it has a great, the fight scene in the, in the sword in the uh, fencing club, that's a great, that's a great fight scene be between Gustav Graves and, and, um, and Bond, I I did like that scene, and I you know the first half of the movie is is not is not bad, but the last half with the laser weapon and all the, the armor, and you're right, man, the disappearing car and the ice palace, it just gets ludicrous. But um, I don't, I didn't hate it. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't hate it. So, uh, Kevin Morales says uh, asks, Hey Rob, did you see Michael B. Jordan's Without Remorse? I did. Why uh, do you think, also, have you heard anything about production on the Rainbow Six movie tease at the end? No, you know, I like the John Clark character a lot. I, I thought that without remorse, it needed more politics in it. It needed, like, the, the thing is, I'm a huge Tom Clancy book fan. I read Hunt for Red October and Red Storm Rising, and I really did like the Jack Ryan character. And then I read all the, all the John Clark books, and I read all the Jack Ryan books all the way up through... Um, executive orders when he becomes president, which I thought they could have done with, with, with Harrison Ford. I mean, why not? Maybe they wouldn't have done Dead of Honor, which we go to war with the Japanese, and that book actually ends with Japanese terrorists crashing a jetliner. I mean, I remember Tom Clancy, the poor man was like going on TV news shows after 9-11 because of the Pentagon attack and how in Dead of Honor at the end of the book, um, most of Congress is wiped out by a jetliner crashing into Congress when it's in session. There's an address happening, and the president's killed, and, and the person, the only person, the highest-ranking member of government is Jack Ryan, who's installed as president in executive orders. And it's uh, that was some crazy shit. And Tom, poor Tom Clancy's like, look, I was making this stuff up, man. I didn't, I didn't think it was really going to happen. So crazy. Stubble McShave comes back and says, I performed a scientific experiment last week. I discovered that it took five st stiff drinks to make Moonraker great. I needed that fuel to bypass my brain and enjoy the space stuff. Well, Stubble, as you know, I n I've never released it. I think it was like four or five years ago, right? When I, maybe four years ago, four summers ago, I did a drunken, I was going to do drunken Bond commentaries, and I just got hammered. And... Uh, I did a Moonraker commentary, but I would film myself in front of my TV watching Moonraker, and I, I'd probably get it. It would probably get demonetized 
But I think getting hammered and watching Moonraker is one way to watch it. Although I love that film. I have a great soft spot for it. It's it's goofy in tone, but there's a lot of cool stuff in it. It's got a great great set of visual effects. I, I love all the stuff in space. You know, call me crazy. But, um, yeah, I, I, I do dig that stuff. So I want to thank you, Kevin, for writing in about the Bond movie. And, uh, you know, let's talk some Moonraker next time because, heck, why not? Um, let's see. This comes from Jamie Starr, the Thumper, uh, a.k.a. Thumper. Jamie says, hey, Rob, I know you're normally movie focused, but as a YouTuber, do you feel as if the rise in YouTube and the visual social media platforms like TikTok, do you see them as contributors toward the decline in people's love for music? The industry was already declining, but I see YouTube's super strict restrictions on music use as a justification for creators to forego it altogether. Lots of podcasts are seemingly modeled after late night shows, minus the music. Another problem is the sync music world isn't interested as music as art, but rather as cheap knockoffs of sure things. Do you see a path for course correction and maybe even a return to the movie soundtracks like we had in the 90s? You know what? That's a great, great um Great question, Jamie. You know, I just saw an ad. Uh, they just put out their a company. I don't remember the company is putting out a box set of all of from the John Hughes movies. John Hughes had a great. He was very forward thinking. He used bands like Love and Rockets and Sieg Sieg Sputnik in in his movies, and that was sometimes the first time. You know, I heard some of those bands. Like I don't think Sieg Sieg Sputnik. The first time I heard them was. I think on the Ferris Bueller's Day Off soundtrack, and I'm like, "What is Love Missile F111?" You know, I start buying the, the, the 12 inches, and then if you get that CD, there's actually commercials in between. Um, people are like, "What the hell are you talking about, Rob? Sieg Sieg Sputnik? What?" I know, um, but anyway, look look it up. It's got some really interesting stuff. The videos are really interesting. They seem kind of silly now, but I I was a big fan of what they were doing at the time. But yeah, I think that movie music. I think music in general has really declined. Um, you know, you don't see, I, I would think that people, there are some people uh, like YouTube features, a lot of people who play their music and stuff, but I would have, I would have expected to see a lot more of that, but I don't know if it's, I think that just youth culture has changed, you know, youth culture, the fact that it is so video oriented, uh, as opposed to music oriented, I mean, it's changed. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it's cyclical. Maybe it'll come back. I mean, what I do love is I love seeing a lot of these reaction channels. I watched some chick popped up in my feed today my YouTube feed, she was watching, she was responding to Comfortably Numb from the live David Gilmore, uh, um, it's, I have that Blu-ray, and she's watching that performance, and I'm like, wow, she'd never heard Comfortably Numb before? It's so weird to me, because, you know, when I was growing up as a child of the 70s and 80s, we listened to everything. You know, I was, I listened to Glenn Miller records, you know, and I listened to 60s rock and album-oriented rock in the 70s, she'll come riding around the mountain on a pony she named wildfire because i love those story songs and they'd make me feel something so yeah i um it's weird i mean i'd love to see uh, like movie music i collected i have hundreds of soundtrack albums on cd I, I don't buy soundtracks anymore the music is so nondescript i will say this though i will say this if you are a star trek music fan uh the star trek music in again picard season three is a return to actual Star Trek music. And um, our composer, Freddie Weedman, who worked uh, the film I produced, The Hills Run Red, and you can get that soundtrack on Verez Saraband, uh, the music is, it brings back all the old Star Trek themes and it'll make you weep. So, yeah, check that stuff out. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings, all of you from across these, the 28 known galaxies. This is just a sh short observations that I wanted to do. I wanted to sing in uh, the praises of the new Sandman series. I'm really loving it. I'm very pleased as something it's uh, a favorite of mine. I hope you all check it out. I'd love to hear what you think of Sandman. Uh, I'd love to have some cogent analysis from all of you. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody who supports this channel via memberships or super chats or tips that's very much appreciated i very much appreciate that i want to thank tom jr jackson for jumping in and becoming a, mo a moderator you know i just this is sort of a last minute um uh a last minute thing <laughs> lawrence welk fan i am a lawrence welk fan why not i watch lawrence welk um so thank you for that and of course tomorrow well later today you'll see me with Dieter bastion on let's get physical media 
uh, hey, I got Tenebrae in 4K. Woohoo! From Arrow. And um, so, yeah, join us at 11 o'clock in the morning for that. You'll see me on the John Campy show. I might be doing another observations later today, Sunday in the afternoon. We shall see. And on that note, Gilbert. Gilbert, how you doing, buddy? The great Gilbert is here. Um, let's see. I wonder if I can get him to come up so you can see him. Oh, I don't I don't have here. Well, maybe. Here, Gilbert, would you like to come up and uh, show people before I sign off? You know you do. Come here. Okay, you're going to come up. Can you do it? Come on. You can do it. There you go, buddy. Yes. Yes. Ha <laughs> ha. I know I probably shouldn't give him gummy bears, but um, he loves them. He loves gummy bears. There you go, buddy. And on that note, everyone, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you as I hoist my large film threat glass of Chardonnay, La Crema Chardonnay, for those of you who care, uh, have a better night. And remember, we are all in, are all in fact goof people. And watch The Sandman. <laughs>